G'day, Chris here and welcome back to Clickspring. So before we dive into the project detail, let's do a quick bit of background on dial indicators. For those wondering, a dial indicator is a tool typically used to measure runout, or the off-axis error of a rotating component. There are many situations in engineering when we need to identify and measure runout, like for example when centering eccentric stock in a lathe, or when checking the quality of components that we'd like to see run quite true. And we can also use the tool for many other things too, like measuring simple travel, tramming a mill, and finding the depth of a hole, and so on. It's an instrument for accurately capturing small displacement measurements and then amplifying them so that they can be clearly read on a dial. Now something interesting about dial indicators is that the concept appears to have originated from within the field of horology. John Logan, a watchmaker from the Waltham Watch Company, who filed several key patents on behalf of the company, also filed a patent for one of the very first small measurement gauges. The patent description frames the invention as a caliper and depth gauge. It specifies a gauging bar measuring travel in reference to fixed caliper jaws, or alternatively a gauging rod. And although it certainly did at least that, with the benefit of hindsight, it's clear that this collection of ideas also carried the essential principles of the mechanical dial indicator. Evidently, Logan and others continued to evolve the design throughout the latter part of the 19th century. The arbor and chain arrangement was replaced with the more robust rack and pinion gearing. And the ideas of a caliper depth gauge and indicator were separated out into distinctly separate tools so that by the time this patent was filed in 1928, things had well and truly settled down into the single-purpose design that we mostly see today. If you were to pull apart one of the modern mechanical dial indicators, you'd find something that looks a lot like these drawings. A rack engaged with a gear train, working against a spring, driving one or more hands on a dial, converting a small linear travel into a greatly magnified rotational travel on a circular dial. Now what I particularly like about dial indicators is that they're such a cool hybrid of horological and general engineering. There's clear elements of the watchmaker's craft in many aspects of the device, with delicate parts and small module gearing. And yet there's also what is for most of us the more familiar general engineering aspects too. So it's a good blend, and for me at least, was an excellent gateway project into working on much smaller scale components. OK, so now let's have a good look at how the gearing works. In this case, we have a one inch travel indicator measuring thousandths of an inch. There are precisely 30 teeth per inch cut into the rack, and there are 30 teeth in the pinion with which it engages. So as the rack travels through a full inch of travel, it turns the corresponding pinion one complete turn. There are 120 teeth on the wheel to which the 30 tooth pinion is attached, that 120 tooth wheel engages with this 12 tooth pinion. So as the wheel makes that full turn, the 12 tooth pinion goes through 10 full turns. Our main pointer is attached to that pinion. So that's 10 full turns of the main pointer for one full inch of travel on the rack. Now we've divided our dial into 100 intervals. So 10 times around the dial for an inch, with 100 intervals each time, gives us 1,000 total intervals for the whole inch of linear travel. And so each graduated interval represents 1,000th of an inch. Now you'll have noticed a counter keeping track of those tenths as they go by. The 12 tooth centre pinion also engages with this 120 tooth wheel. And so for each full turn of the 12 tooth pinion, this wheel goes through one tenth of a turn. So our tenths pointer is attached to that wheel, and simply by dividing that dial up into tenths, it gives us our tenths counter. Of course, the initial driving wheel is doing the same thing as the 120 tooth count wheel, just in reverse. But it's convenient to do things this way, because it lets us attach a small hairspring on the count wheel to oppose the action of the gearing and so continually act to eliminate backlash. Now a valid question is what tooth profile should be used for this mechanism, cycloidal or involute? In the context of horology, the merits of each continue to be debated, mostly around the issue of train friction and efficiency, two issues that don't really concern us in this context. 
but there is one clear advantage that the involute profile has over the cycloidal, and that's a relative indifference to accurate depthing. It can tolerate a fairly wide range of error that the cycloidal profile simply can't. And as it happens, this provides us with a huge simplification when it comes to the assembly and mechanism design. So it's no surprise that the vast majority of dial indicators on the market today employ the involute gearing profile. Now in terms of the required tools for the project, many of the project's specific tools will be constructed during the course of the build, a couple of which should serve the shop for years to come. There will also be some small accessory tools, like for example these pivot files and burnishes, that would be nice to have if the budget permits. But one tool that I've made a conscious choice to avoid specifying is a watchmaker's staking tool. It's an expensive tool to buy for a one-off project, and as much as it would have been nice to plan construction around one, I'd like to keep the project open to as many people as possible. So this means that the arbors, for example, have been designed to be bonded to their wheels and pinions, rather than staked. And for those other tasks for which a staking tool would be the natural choice, I'll show alternative methods to complete the work. Having said that, it's very easy to modify the components so that everything could be staked if you'd prefer. So it's still very much an option if you're already equipped with a staking tool or if you're looking for a good excuse to buy one. The one tool that is essential for the project is a small lathe, preferably equipped with both a standard three-jaw chuck and a set of watchmaker's collets. Here's a closer look at the machine that I'll be using for all of the small components. It uses a small adapter sleeve to convert from the spindle morse taper to the collet taper, but otherwise the general principles are common across similar machines. A draw tube threads onto the rear of each collet, providing the closing force to pull the collet into the headstock and close down on the workpiece. Each collet in this set is separated by 0.1 of a millimetre, which gives you an idea of their closing range. Now the importance of collets becomes clear once we start to make components that need to be accurately rechucked end for end to form the various features. Collets are rarely perfect, but they do give us enough accuracy to do almost everything that we need to do in most cases, like for example forming these arbor pivots. Now by design, collets tend to hold quite delicate parts, so of course light cuts are the standard for all of this turning work. And it's worth pointing out that the graduated hand wheels and the overall light feel on this particular lathe makes for quite accurate and repeatable cuts. These arbors are being cut from blued pivot steel, which does tend to be quite hard on the cutting tool. So frequent sharpening is a must to get the very best out of the lathe. And the approach for each of these arbors is essentially the same. The various seatings and shoulders are formed as per the drawings, with the pivot surfaces in particular burnished to a high finish. Okay, so that's the arbors complete, now let's take a look at the wheels and pinions. The cutter fabrication process is presented in detail in the five part TGT gear cutter series, so be sure to check that out if you've not already seen it. The series covers all of the steps to create multi-tooth form relieved cutters, and also provides the necessary data to use them. Now of course, almost all aspects of this build are occurring on quite a small scale. 
and so in absolute terms the tolerance to error is quite low. Where it might generally be okay to simply drill and then ream a centre hole for a large clock wheel, perhaps accepting a few hundredths of a millimetre eccentricity here and there. For this application the centre hole must be absolutely dead on axis and on size, which means it needs to be drilled under size and then bored out to final dimension. The boring tool I'm using is 1.5mm wide at the cutting edge, so it can be carefully manoeuvred into say a 1.6mm diameter hole and then used to gently open it up. Now the tool is quite slender and so is susceptible to a little bit of spring during the cut, but it's easy enough to manage, usually by approaching the final dimension slowly and by keeping in mind that a couple of spring passes will be necessary to truly finish the cut. The lathe is set up for division and wheel cutting as required, and then the cutter sends it on the work. The cutter is then lowered into the work at the full required depth, as specified in the gear calculator, and all teeth are formed in a single pass. A very light touch on 800 grit abrasive paper knocks off the small burr formed when cutting the teeth and gives us our first chance to inspect the tooth profile. Now two of these wheels are required and they can be cut separately or if a good CA glue bond can be maintained between the blanks then both could be cut at the same time and then separated with acetone later. Ok, now for the pinions. And as always, pinions tend to be the components requiring the greatest care and preparation to ensure a good outcome. The cutters are quite delicate and much is being asked of them. Also the parent stock must be extended quite a bit to provide the clearance for the cutters to operate safely. So it's clear we have a need to provide some tailstock support. This simple brace when held in the tailstock will do the job. And the blank is cut to suit. The cutter is centred on the work in the usual way, and then the tailstock support engaged and locked off for the duration of the cut. Chip jams are a common source of damage to both the cutter and the workpiece, so constant chip removal, in my case with a flow of compressed air, is a must. And I found the fragility of the pinion cutters is best managed by keeping the cut depths modest. With shop made cutters in particular, I generally form the pinion in three passes. The first two passes take off the bulk of the material in roughly equal amounts, leaving on just enough material for a final light finishing pass. Now I should point out that if you wanted, you could turn the pivots and wheel seating from this raw pinion stock as it stands right now and save some of the work in forming a separate arbour. This would be an alternative to keeping everything as separate components, 
but it would remove the flexibility of being able to conveniently swap out components if required later on in the build. Each approach has its pros and cons. Certainly, when building the prototype for this series, it was helpful to have the flexibility to be able to just remake an arbor, for example, rather than having to cut another pinion too. In any event, all subsequent cuts for the pinion heads can be managed by using a simple pot chuck, turned to size from brass rod. When the pinion just starts to grab in the recess, the dimension is close to what it needs to be, with a spring pass or two eventually permitting a firm fit. Again, the pinion is drilled under size and then the boring tool used to open up the hole to the correct dimension. The smaller centre pinion requires the same sort of considerations, all of course on a much smaller scale, and so with the requirement of even greater care, particularly when centering the cutter. Again, clearing away chips, as well as keeping the cut depths, feed rates and RPMs modest, are the best ways to extend the life of the cutter. Now as it happens, the diameter of this pinion puts it into the range of the watchmaker collets, which provides a much more convenient option for facing and drilling than a pot chuck. And given that it's quite short, another possibility once drilled is to friction fit the part onto a stub arbor to then face it to length. A couple of these parts will continue to be worked on for the fitting of the hand assemblies, and all will still need to be taken to their final finish in a later video. But for now, we can dry fit them to confirm that all is as it should be. So that's the first parts of the project complete. And as I mentioned in the preview episode, there will be several other project videos running in parallel with this main build. For example, the construction of a watchmaker's style faceplate. So keep an eye out for those side projects too. But in the next video of the main series, I'll continue the build by making the probe assembly. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.